conservative, constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. Hey, y'all, Andrew Cooper Writer here, Andrew Cooper Writer Show. I'm going to skip my longer intro. We've got an action packed full day. Uh, I've got General Michael Flynn on for an interview. Before we hop on over to that, make sure you're heading on over to theandrewshow.com. If you want to listen to the audio format that comes out Monday through Friday, this video show only comes out once a week, but new episodes are put out daily in the podcast format as well as on WZXI. Uh, if, as a reminder, General Flynn will be in Kentucky on Monday at 6 p.m. in Shepherdsville. Head on over to rwfforumky.org. That's rwf forumky.org to get your free tickets to that event. There are some upgraded options too as well, but the general mission is now free. So please head on over to rwfforumky.org. Sign up for the event. Uh, without further ado, let's hop on over to the interview with me and General Flint. Obviously right now in the Senate, they have a uh, aid package to Ukraine, to Israel, to Taiwan as well. I've seen you Tweeting about that here in Kentucky, our two senators are completely on different sides. We got McConnell, the big Republican pusher, Rand Paul, the uh, one taking a stand against it with this uh, long filibuster just ended. But um, what is your take on the overall aid package uh, in general? I know you're against, obviously, the, the Ukraine war. Um, but as far as aid to Israel, aid to Taiwan? Well, I mean, so first of all, I appreciate you, you bringing me on. And, uh, you know, in terms of Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell, because uh, your show is in Kentucky, correct? Yeah. Your yeah. audience? Yes, yeah. absolutely. All so Kentucky. I, I, think, I, I think if anybody in, in the state of Kentucky that still thinks that Mitch McConnell has their back is, is so wrong, Mitch McConnell needs to resign immediately. I mean, this guy is trying to do things in secret instead of instead of being very public which is supposed to be as a as a uh, as an as an elected official he needs to do things in public in the light of day especially with everything going on in our country today and uh, it looks like Mitch McConnell is trying to hide what really amounts to a uh, uh, an action against the the best interests of the United States of America there is clearly no reason no good reasons to continue to fund the war in Ukraine. I do think that the Middle East package, you know, and when we say package, what does that mean? We're talking about billions of, of dollars that are going over, that are continuing to go overseas when we have so many problems right here at home. Never mind the border invasion, the, the, the uh, amount of fentanyl that's killing Americans in the, to the tune of hundreds of thousands on the streets of America, killing and wounding. And we have, uh, homeless veterans in our country that still can't get a place to sleep at night. I mean, the amount of money that we're spending overseas. And so frankly, Mitch McConnell, you know, and your audience, I'm, 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 I'm sad to say, has a person in the United States Senate who is the head of the Republican Party in the Senate that, uh, that you know, frankly, should be recalled. And, I, and, and, you know, there's ways that they can do that, but the Senate needs to start that action. So, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm against anything right now that is not in the, in the clear, uh, um, interest of the United States of America and are clearly outlined by the current president of the United States. So if any of your audience is waiting for the, the president of the United States to give what I've called for is a state of the union to outline the objectives for the war that we're engaged in in Europe, the war that we're engaged in in the Middle East, the war that we're engaged in on the border, the war that we're engaged in in, in uh, major swaths of uh, Central America, particularly down in the places like the Darien Gap, and the war that we're engaged in in the Pacific. We have yet to hear this president say anything about that. Mitch McConnell appears to be either in his pocket or in the pocket of the large military, industrial, and security state complex. So. So, yeah, you want my opinion or you want my judgment on where we need to be for your audience? Uh, we need to be uh, taking care of America first. We need to be taking care of this country first. That The billions of dollars that we're sending overseas, we might as well throw it in a bathtub, throw some gas on it and light it, and light it on fire. 
because it is totally worthless. So that money that will go overseas will go into somebody's pocket or many, many persons pockets, plural. So um, yesterday you retweeted a, a J.D. Vance tweet about how in this bill there is a uh, uh, like a landmine for Donald Trump yeah. leading to impeachment. Should he be elected? Uh, could you expand upon what what that is and how that would work? Yeah, so people can go to at, at those that are on X, those of your audience that are on X, they can go to at Jen Flynn and, and scroll down to where I specifically talk about this. Uh, Senator Vance, a senator from Ohio, good man uh, and, and former military guy, good, good man, good senator. He's in there fighting. I think he's He's not completely tainted yet. I mean, everybody's got to look at where the where all of our political uh, elected officials money comes from. J.D. Vance, Senator Vance from the state of Ohio, he uh, discovered in reading this this horrific bill that there is a a sort of a nuclear bomb, if you will, inside there for whoever becomes the next president of the United States, because clearly, clearly. The left, you know, uh, believe that there is a chance that Donald J. Trump could become the next president of the United States because, of course, he's leading in all the all the major polls, not just in the Republican primaries, but he's leading in all the major national polls against Joe Biden. And no, nobody thinks that Joe Biden's even going to run for president again, even though he continues to we continue to hear that out of uh, parts of his camp. But we've heard it less and less. So I don't believe he's going to run against Joe Biden if we have an election. So. Um, this this bomb that's inside of the bill basically allows Congress, if they want to impeach this president, impeach a future president, if they don't follow some set of rules that the that the legislative branch, in this case, that the U.S. Senate is slipping into this bill. These are the kinds of things that are done in the in the in the cloak of night. Right. In the secrecy, in these backroom deals. And this is why like some people like Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi in the past says, we got to sign these before you read it. Right. No, I'm glad that uh, Senator Paul from your great state, he's read the bill. I know Senator Johnson from the state of Wisconsin. He's read the bill. I know uh, Senator Vance has read the bill because they're bringing up these issues. And again, what, what anybody needs to do is just go dig into where their money's coming from. And more than likely, it's coming from either the military industrial complex or it's coming from uh, the security state complex or it's coming from <clears throat> places that that uh, that are that have some benefit that they are going to get if this bill is passed. And if Speaker Johnson doesn't kill it and I mean kill it like like, you know, nail it dead to the wall uh, and, and not let this thing go forward, then Speaker Johnson is going to find himself out of, out of a job, I believe, because we just can't have these kinds of egregious bills that are being passed by by uh, people in Congress. And this is why for, for your audience, this is why people have to get out and vote. That's why you have a Democrat for a governor of the state of Kentucky right now, because voter turnout, because people, frankly, and excuse my Irish, don't give a about voting and they go, oh, politics, my vote doesn't count. Well, it doesn't count if you don't vote. It clearly doesn't count if you don't vote. We cannot have people we cannot have votes like what we had in that state or and in, and in many other states where the voter turnout is like less than 40 percent. Forty percent of people who could who can vote, who are registered to vote, turn out. That means 60 percent don't. And so anybody that's listening that's ever been a teacher, you you get a 40 on a test. That's an F. OK, so for Kentucky voters, that's what happens when people that's what happens when you get an F for voting and we get an F for voting. We have got to turn out in droves, folks, on pri for primaries and then for general elections. When I say droves, I'm talking about 85, 90, 95 percent. Now, General Flynn, if you have time, I'd love to ask you one more question. Go ahead. Uh, we'll have to have that, though, after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Kubrater Show, your source for Kentucky politics. If you want to reach out to the show, feel free to email info at the Andrew show.com. Once again, that's info at the Andrew show.com. We'll be back in just a few, few short minutes. And you are back with the Andrew Cooper writer show. We're continuing on with our interview of general Michael 
Flynn. General Flynn will be in Kentucky this Monday at six o'clock in Shepherdsville. That event is free. Uh, general missions free. You can purchase upgraded tickets. You can head on over to RWF forum, ky.org. Once again, that's RWF forum, ky.org in order to get those free tickets. General, thank you for staying on and allowing me to ask you one more question. So obviously Mitch McConnell, he's a big pusher of these bills, uh, this foreign aid bills to Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel, and as such, as we spoke about before. Now, when he's going around and he's telling people why we need this, he says that if we do not support Ukraine, if we do not support Taiwan, if we do not support Israel, we will look weak on the national stage and will embolden our enemies like China, like Russia. What do you say to push back on that? Our military right now is incapable of fighting the wars that we currently have, incapable. That means that they don't have the weapon systems, they don't have the readiness levels, they don't have the uh, training levels, they don't have the ammunition stockage, we don't have the right uh, capabilities and, 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 the, and the capabilities that the, our military needs, in some cases, some of the very specific, very defensive and very offensive capabilities in some of the high tech systems that we have are years out from being able to be uh, incorporated into our uh, military. But our military is not trained, uh, ready and prepared to win our nation's wars. So if we don't spend money on our own military, never mind the rest of all the things that I've been talking about here, then uh, then forget about all these wars overseas. I mean, remember, we just came out of we just came out of two decades plus of wars in the Middle East and Central Asia, Af you know, Afghanistan is in Central Asia and Iraq is in the Middle East and we lost both of them. And we retreated with our tails between our legs from one, Afghanistan, and we left US citizens behind and a ton of equipment that we now are learning is being sold to the Mexican cartels in Mexico, are being sold on the black markets in Africa, and some of it's even finding its way into Ukraine. So. So you know what? Stop it with the, with the you know, oh Russia, all that, you know, all these people overseas. If we don't take care of our, if our, we don't take care of our country right now, we don't get better leaders in, uh, in, uh, in the, in the controlling these levers of power in our government, then we're going to find ourselves being the United Socialist States of America. So while while I'm on, I, I just want to make make mention that I am going to be coming up to uh, Kentucky here uh, this coming Monday, the 19th of March. And I'm supporting the Republican Federal, uh, the Republican Women's Federal Forum uh, of Kentucky, and it's a great organization. Uh, Diana Starr, I'll mention her name. I hope that you you can run this, but uh, Diana Starr is a great organizer, great person. She's been in touch with my office, and we've planned this trip for a for a bit. So I'll be up there, uh, hopefully, to talk about some of this and maybe some other topics. I, I call it, you know, talking. We need to talk about freedom in this country. And we need to talk about uh, how we're moving forward. We, th this event will be supported by, by veterans for Trump, a great gentleman by the name of Chad Caton. In order to get tickets, you can go to uh, RWF Forum, KY, RWF Forum, KY.org. And I know, and you might have some information about some of the, because uh, some of this is free tickets. Uh, yes, yeah, so a, uh, a donor graciously um kicked in a lot of money to cover any general mission ticket. So from here on out, general mission is free. It is absolutely free to attend this event. It is only preferred seating uh, that you can purchase. Anybody who's already bought tickets uh, has been upgraded to preferred seating. Yeah, good. And with preferred seating, I mean, uh, what I, I mean, I, I do these, I, I do these fairly often. I mean, I love doing it. Um, preferred seating means that, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, you know, maybe I, I think if the way they set it up and organize it will, get a chance to to meet uh, take some photos and stuff like that but I love people and uh, and I'm very much looking forward to coming up there and speaking on behalf of really uh, this country and myself and for my background I mean uh, people can go look me up they can say what they want to say about me but and they can believe me or not doesn't make any difference to me at this stage what I believe in is that we are at risk as a nation and if we don't uh, get the right leaders into into the highest offices of our country, we could lose everything. So, and I don't plan on allowing that while I can uh, stand on at least my two feet. So I appreciate the time 
And uh, people can go to rwfforumky.org. That's rwfforumky.org and uh, get your tickets and I'll see you on, uh, on Monday. Well, thank you, General. I'll be seeing you there, too. I'll actually be running the Q&A for that event for you, so that way uh, we can keep it tight in there. But uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an honor talking to the only person that uh, Obama told Trump not to hire. Uh, <laughs> uh, but thank you, and we'll see you Monday. All right. God bless. See you. Head on over to the rwfforum.org. That's rwfforumky.org, rwfforumky.org. Head on over there and grab those tickets. Make sure you register for your free tickets and go ahead and please purchase those upgraded tickets. Uh, if you want to, like I said, get a little special interaction there, General Flynn, I'll be there. I think I will actually be handling the Q and a portion for General Fr Flynn's uh, event there. So you will be able to show up and ask questions uh, and I'll try to make sure we get as many questions in as we can. But what's interesting, and, and we kind of touched on this in that interview, is that we, in this current state of politics, we have two senators at the federal level, Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell, both completely different, but yet both are Republicans, both are elected by the same electorate, but so diametrically opposed on many things, not just on foreign policy issues, but also if you remember during the whole COVID scare there, while Rand Paul's out there asking those important questions of Fauci, asking those important questions about the scientific process behind those vaccines, Mitch McConnell is using his campaign funds to go ahead and run ads encouraging people to get vaccinated. So th they have been diametrically opposed, just so opposite on so many issues for so long. It's no wonder. Uh, it, it just points to our current state of politics that the same people from the same party getting elected by the same people can be so different. And it just kind of tells you what we as a voters need to do differently. As General Flynn said, if you still think Mitch McConnell's got your back, you are mistaken. He clearly is more worried about his legacy than anything else. Um, and you know, the, the politics nowadays, it's just, geez, you just feel that tension. You feel like something's got to break. Speaking of tricky politics over in Kentucky legislature, we have the first of several shell bills filed. This will be something we'll be watching closely throughout, uh, the remainder of the legislative year. For those who are unaware of what shell bills are, there is a cutoff to when, you can file bills. However, there's this thing called committee subs. And so when a bill comes to committee, you can submit a committee sub that completely changes the entire uh, uh, meaning and purpose of the bill. And so when we talk about, uh, you'll hear me talk about shell bills. What I'm talking about is a bill that does something pretty innocuous. Like in this case, about five have been filed and they'll, you know, change some gender neutral language, uh, instead of he, she, or he, or they just something real mi minuscule that doesn't actually matter. And then when time comes past filing deadline, if there's still a few more bills they want to squeeze in, leadership does, they'll go ahead and initiate calling one of these bills forward and then submitting the committee sub in committee. Now, what to watch for on these bills and the reason why it's so troublesome is the fact that uh, you have no idea what the bill's going to be. You as the public, I as the public, we have no clue uh, what that bill will end up looking like until sometimes after it's passed the House because it can go into this committee, be subbed out with the committee sub. You don't get to read the committee sub. It then gets pulled forward the next day for a vote on the floor, much like we just saw with the budget, which had a committee sub. Then the legislators who's left to vote on that are just getting that bill uh, a few minutes before they hit the floor, having to vote on what is probably a very key bill for leadership. Well, we as the citizens are unable to even access what the bill is. It will take us a full another day before it would get posted online for us to read and weigh in. And if we don't have the opportunity to weigh in on legislation being voted on, how can they hear from us? How can they end up making decisions that represent us? Of course, that's probably part of the design is to make sure they can't represent us, don't you think?
It's kind of all broken. <laughs> and honestly, too, what's the use of a bill filing deadline if we're going to have committee subs in the first place? Just get rid of the bill filing deadline. The only thing it applies to then is those who are among the grassroots, people who are proposing bills that leadership doesn't want done. And of course, leadership is pushing forward bills that they want done based upon who lines those coffers. A lot of people wonder, how does leadership keep control? Well, it goes into a few different uh, funds in the House, you have the Republican House Caucus Campaign Committee and the Senate, you have the Senate Caucus Campaign Committee. Uh, and in these committees, they can give unlimited amounts of money to uh, members of their body, so of the House. And then also they're allowed to coordinate with campaigns, something normal PACs and donors aren't per se allowed to do. And so their control over that, which leadership has control over, is how they can control the votes, how they can control what people do. Because if you go against them, not only would they not give you money out of the House Caucus Campaign Committee or the Senate Caucus Campaign Committee, but they may end up using that money to actually fund an opponent against you unlimited funding and that campaign coffers the thing that makes them keep control that gives them power is funded by big donors corporations people who want to see payoffs for their donations but they're not really donations as we say so often they're investments you see it's a cycle house leadership senate leadership wants to remain in power they want power they want people to do what they tell them to do but in order to do that they need to have control over money in order to have control over money they have to do the bidding of the corporations and it's a cycle that continues on and is continuing to destroy everything our government was supposed to be well Coming up after this, we're going to be digging into a few comments by a uh, Republic, if Republican, a Democrat House rep out of Louisville last week made some comments on KET, but that coupled with a recent bill proposed by a Republican senator uh, points a pretty bleak future for our children and for the future of families in Kentucky. We'll be going over that after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Cooperwriter Show. And you are back with the Andrew Cooperwriter Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Recently in KET, we heard a Democrat representative out of Louisville. She's currently working on exiting the House, running for city council in Louisville. I guess that's a job she'd rather do. After all, she can do a better job of inflicting her extreme liberal beliefs on people there where liberals continue to run that city. But she went on a little bit of a tirade that she's very proud of. She has pinned this onto her Facebook page. She's shared it. She's very excited about what she's done here. And so let's take a look at this short clip here of Josie Raymond telling us what's really, really important to her and, and telling us all that if we're not willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on all kinds of boondoggle things, well, we are just awful people. Let's take a look. When it comes to this issue, when it comes to child care, when it, when it comes to the burdens that we put on mothers, in this commonwealth. There are ideological differences about fiscal policy, yes. There are also, frankly, some really jacked up ideas about the role of women in society, right? You have women at work serving an elected office voting to make it so other women can't go to work, right? You have women voting saying only wealthy women can go to work. You have women saying only women whose own mothers can watch their children can go to work, right? And so we need to really name it. Anti-child care is anti-woman. So <laughs> there's a lot in there to unpack in that short 48 seconds. So obviously she's going off because she doesn't like the fact that our Kentucky state budget doesn't give enough of your money to people who've decided to have children. And I think that's a very incredibly important thing we have to ask ourselves. I understand this concept we have as a community that we feel like, well, you got to take care of the children, using that as a cudgel to obviously get in place the kinds of policies that so often that we see socialist kind of communist policies. They're all our children. We all have to take care of them. And it's very difficult to say this, but it is true. They're not all of our children. They're your children that you decided to have. And basically every single case, unless a rape was involved, which is a very minuscule amount, despite how much Democrats want to make a big deal about it, you decided to have a child. I mean, in there she said, we put on mothers. Who's we? Who is we? I'm not there. Sure, I have a child that I take care of. I haven't put anything on his mother. I take care of the child in the sense of, you know, making sure childcare, everything's taken care of. 
I don't turn to society to take care of it. Who's we that put it on mother? Who are we? Are we out here making rules and laws demanding that you have children? Is it not your own decision to have children? I mean, is, is there no self accountability here? And, and, and to say, well, if you're not willing to fund childcare, you're voting so women can't go to work. We, we have women out here voting so women can't go to work. Where, where has there been a law that anybody's voted for that say women can't work? And more specifically, you're saying that women who are single moms can't work. That's, that's more specifically what she's saying here. Why? Because if a woman is not a single mom, it's not on her that she's deciding that, that on society that voting for her not to work, she has decided not to work. A husband, a wife, have a child. If they need to live off one income, the wife could work and the husband could stay home. No, that's something they're choosing to do. So really what we're talking about is, is you're, you're voting so single moms can't go to work. If you're not willing to pay thousands of dollars a year to a woman because she had a child, well, obviously you just don't want her to work in the first place, do you? It was her choice to have a child, but now you, of course, have to pay for it. Only wealthy women can go to work. What are you talking about? Only wealthy women can go to work? What are, what are you talking about? Who took that vote? Is there, is there some bill I was unaware of that has come down through our house that's been voted on that said it, you, you have to make at least X amount a year as a woman in order to be allowed to go to work? No, that of course isn't it. Anti-child care is anti-woman. Well, I, first off, I would pose a question to Josie that I think she'd have a hard time answering, which is what is a woman? <laughs> I mean, she probably can't even define it. But yet she does know that if you don't want child care taken care of, well, you're anti-woman. But the very fact that this is the conversation, never once does Josie say that we should be demanding fathers take care of their kids. No, 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 no. It's on us, the people, to do it. And, and really, it's this constant system and setup that is continuing to create this very awful situation we're in. We're destroying the nuclear family. We are encouraging women to have kids out of wedlock. Look at the system right now, okay? Look at how it operates. You would be a fool. So let's say back in the day, when probably many of you grew up, when you had a kid with somebody out of wedlock, you did the, the right thing, right? And you went and got married, and, and the father took care of the family the way they were supposed to. And the woman could choose to stay home. She could also go to work. Now, there's, there's a lot of conversation here about women going into the workplace is probably the worst thing that's ever happened for our economy. For those of you right now clutching your pearls, I'm not saying per se, the shift of saying not, we, we didn't honor the fact that women choosing to stay home is honorable. It's one of the biggest things to do for society. No, we said women have to go to work. Or we could have said something even more remarkable and important. Maybe, maybe instead of saying and pushing two parents to have to work in the household, saying, hey, maybe fathers can stay home. That's okay too, if that's your decision. But no, instead as a society, we didn't say, hey, women, men, either can work, but one person needs to stay home and make sure they're raising the kids. It doesn't matter who it is. Instead of saying that, we said, no, 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 we have to have two incomes in the household. And that two incomes in a household has done some of the biggest damage to our society as a whole for several reasons. And it's not just me who says this. You know who says this? Elizabeth Warren. She actually wrote a book called The Two Income Trap that when women started working alongside of men also working as a commonplace and to be expected in society, what started happening is, is the explosion of costs and expenses has skyrocketed because obviously market expands to demand. Something costs as much as people are willing to pay for it. And the more money in the household, the more uh, uh, expendable income you have, the more you're willing to spend on things. There's nothing wrong with women working, but the problem is, is that by creating a society where households have to have two incomes, we are doing a giant disservice to our children 
And we've made it to where you literally can't live off of only one income. But instead of acknowledging that and acknowledging the damage that that kind of feminism, like I said, is there value in saying, hey, you know, maybe men can stay home and raise kids and women don't have to necessarily all be the ones staying home and raising kids? Maybe we can have that debate. I would say that some maybe would choose that. You're ignoring a lot of natural wiring of both men and women in the process. But I'm sure as we look at a whole, there's probably percentages that would rather switch places. That's okay. You live your life. I'll live mine. But society pushing two people to work. And so that's how we've created where you can't live off one income. You need all this extra help if you try to. And we've incentivized it. I mean, like I said, you would be a fool to get married if you had a kid right now. You're giving up food stamps, free education, free childcare, for everything. In fact, until a woman currently in our current system, until a woman goes and asks for actual cash and child assistance, cash money into her bank account from the government, they don't go after the father to support anything. And there's no communicate and, and, and offering these incentives to stay apart means that you're not married, means it's easier to break up. And that naturally causes more single parent households, which is leading to all of our issues in society. And not to mention, it is financially unsustainable. How unsustainable is this way that we're running things? Is it how we are operating and how we are pushing forward this narrative on women must work? Even single moms must work. They, they are not saying, well, even single moms, of course, single moms have to work, but everybody has to be working. There's no dignity in staying home and making it work. How damaging is it? And how much is it costing us the taxpayer? We're going to be going over that after this short break. You're listening to The Andrew Cooper Writer Show. And you are back with The Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. I'm sure I've managed to upset a lot of people, as I said, the unsable, the kind of hard conversation that we all had to have. And that is, has our society actually benefited by two parents working or this idea that every parent has to work by creating a system that incentivizes people to stay apart, that incentivizes single moms to remain single moms? What damage has this done to society? And the stats are in. Not only uh, is, is the vast amount of our criminals coming from single parent households and youth crime is on a massive rise, not only does worse performance in schools come from single parent households, literally every single indicator of a child's success, almost, almost every single negative outcome when it comes from a child to an adult, we can see a huge correlation between single parent households and the outcome of the kids. We can, it's massive. When you only have one parent involved, that one parent has to work. They can't pay as close attention. And you don't have that evenness of handling. You don't have both a male and female role model in a child's life, something that is incredibly and very important. So not only is it damaging our society, causing bad outcomes for kids, but also let's look at the cost here. Let's look at Louisville. So in Louisville, we already spend $20,000 a year on a child for K through 12 education on average, over 20 grand a year paid for by the taxpayers. Throw in other benefits like SNAP, you know, uh, 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 child care assistance early on, WIC programs, the list goes on and on. Throw in all those assistance. And on average in Louisville, we're spending around $350,000 to $400,000 per kid on average of child care assistance, assistance for children. That's $22,000 a year per child. That's just from kids zero to 18 on average, not to mention spending as they become adults on top of all that. That is unsustainable as a taxpayer, $22,000 per child. Think about that. That is a lot of money to spend per child. And yet, we continue to push this forward. We continue to say that, no, no, no. If you, just as Josie said in our last segment, if you don't want to continue to spend money on this, you just hate women. No, it's not that I hate women. It's that I love families. And what are we teaching our next generation? We're teaching them to go ahead and suckle off the government teat. That's what we're doing. I mean, you saw this most recently at the federal level as they're offering EBT cards <laughs> to kids 
over the summer that don't normally have EBT cards because they go to a school and they qualify for free and reduced lunch. That doesn't mean they themselves have a low income, remind you. It just means that their school is in an area that is considered low income. So therefore the school entirety, all students, regardless if your parents are driving a Porsche to drop you off, get free and reduced lunch and breakfast. And so they wanted to issue EBT cards to families that don't even have EBT cards to give the kids $40, $50 a month. Now you saw a few governors say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And they got called child. Imagine not wanting kids to be fed. You're awful. You call yourselves Christians. That's not charity. It's not about wanting kids not to be fed. Okay. It's not about that at all. It's about saying that, Hey, we should be teaching people to be self-reliant. We should be telling people to take accountability for their own decisions. Not to go into other people's pockets and take out of it. Now, you, obviously, as I showed you, this was a conversation from a Democrat going just ham, saying if, if, if you don't want to spend all this money, all this spending on kids, well, you're just awful. You're anti-woman. You've decided women can't work. You're, that's what she said. She said, you're literally voting that women can't work. So you'd expect at least conservatives to push back and say, no, 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 no. This is crazy stuff. We need to stop encouraging our citizens to exist out the government. We need to stop creating hammocks, but instead hand ups, right? Not handouts. <laughs> we need to get them on their feet so that way we can go ahead and allow and, and, and get our spending under control because this is unsustainable. So you think conservatives would be pushing that at least, or at least not buying into this kind of rhetoric that you're anti-woman if you don't fund this, but you would be mistaken because we just saw Senator Carol file a bill putting $300 million into child care, extra child care assistance, or as he said, early childhood education, caving in Bashir's universal pre-K talk. We saw him file that bill, at least you think it's DOA. The KY Senate GOP retweeted out articles about him posting that, clearly indicating that they somehow favor this type of action. $300 million. Now, I've talked about how this destroys society, but you ask, Andrew, why are people finding this? Why do they think this is a good idea? Let me tell you why. And this is really dark. This is dystopian. Okay. When the biggest pushers of this bill, is the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Why? Because they say we need more people in the workforce. We want to keep attracting companies. We want it to be easier to hire. Therefore, we need to get more people working. And so what we'll go ahead and do is we'll reach into everybody's pocket, take out 300 million, and we're going to fund childcare to get more moms back into the workforce. Now, not to mention, of course, I'm not talking about cutting off all the other things. Because let me ask you, if you had the choice between you either work or you die because you can't feed yourself. How many people would get off their butts and go to work, do you think? Now you say, Andrew, that's dark, that's mean. I didn't create the human condition. Before this modern society, if you didn't work, you died. If you didn't go out and provide for yourself, nobody was going to. It was on you. It wasn't on everybody else to take care of you. That's not my fault. That is how we've been made. That's design. That's how literally every single animal is in the animal kingdom. You can get mad at me for speaking the truth, but it is the truth. But instead of cutting off all these other things, they say, look, we're just going to go throw another 300 million into child care. As if that's the thing. Oh, no, we're going to continue to incentivize and pay you to basically not work. We're going to continue to pay single mom. When I talked about like the way it's set up now, you're a fool to get married if you have a child. Let me explain this, okay? You're a single mom. You can go out. You can get free child care, free college education, food stamps, WIC, free child assistance. You can get all this stuff free. And then on top of that, oh, by the way, you can be living with this whole time, your boyfriend, who's the father of your child, 
who's making 150 K a year. And you think what suddenly, because we provided 300 million more for childcare. Well, that's going to be what gets people into the workplace. Let me tell you. Well, how are they surviving now if they're not working? How are they doing it? We're not seeing mass amount of single moms and babies dead in the streets. It's not like they're going hungry. It's not like they're living out there homeless. When's the last time you saw a homeless child? They're not homeless. How are they surviving now? But you think what? Because they have somewhere to drop off their kid now every day, they might say, you know what? Sure, yeah. I've been, you know, for the last 10 years, not having to work, getting government assistance, able to survive. But you know what I'm going to go ahead and do? I'm now going to go ahead and get to work. Because now my kid's being watched. I mean, is this logical to anybody? Am I missing something? I don't think so. Maybe you think I'm way off base. Email the show, info at theandrewshow.com. But look, I get it. Today's some hard conversations. You heard some hard conversations from General Flynn. You're getting a hard conversation from me right now. We got to start encouraging people to take care of themselves because we can't afford to continue to take care of them while also taking care of everybody else who works with their own money. We're taking so much away from everybody who works that they're, they're falling into poverty. You're not helping anybody. You're just dragging everybody down. Well, y'all, that's what we got time for today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back here tomorrow. Audio only, though, so make sure you're following us on all major podcasting platforms and listening to us on WZXI. Have a great rest of your day.